Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, fourth uh, homotopy type theory lecture in um, in the hottest summer school of 2022. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Ulrich Buchholz. Uh, he holds a position at the University of Nottingham, and uh, Ulrich's interests um, um, they uh, range from proof theory to univalent mathematics. He is a co-author of the forthcoming uh, symmetry book. Um, he does um, uh, uh, formalization of mathematics, synthetic homotopy theory, and, uh, and the list goes on. It's just a big pleasure to introduce you, Ulrich. Um, take it away. Thank you very much, Egbert, and thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to speak of this. I'm looking very much forward to it. It's such a great energy, and it's just so wonderful to see so many people interested in this topic. Okay, so I'm going to take off uh, where um, Paige left off. So in Paige's lectures, we did um, most of the rules of type theory, uh, so the structural rules, and we talked about type, the type formers for uh, pi types, sigma types, the empty type, the unit type, the natural numbers type, uh, disjoint unions or co-products, and the identity type. So that's all part of the first five sections of uh, Egbert's nice uh, book on introduction to homotopy type theory. And today we're gonna talk about the remaining big family of types, namely the universes, which are covered in section six. So that's one part of the talk. And the other part is we will dig a little bit deeper into the propositions as types paradigm, also known as the Curry-Howard interpretation. We've already uh, seen that both in the ACTA track and in the earlier lectures, and we'll just round that off a bit more um, in the second part of the lecture. Okay, so let's uh, make a new slide here. So universes, why do we need universes? Why do we need universes? Okay, so talk about three reasons. Um, so the first one is important, but also maybe a little, uh, yeah, it's interesting. We, in the, with the rules so far, we actually can't prove that true is not false in the Booleans or zero is not one in the natural numbers. So say we wanna prove that zero is not one in the natural numbers. To do that, you actually need a universe. What does zero not equal to one mean? This means um, that you have a term of type if zero is one with the identity type in the natural numbers, then you have an element of the empty type. That's how we express negation, negation of the uh, identity zero equal to one. And so we're gonna do that by making some type families over the natural numbers defined by induction. And you can think another reason we need universes. So more generally, generally, um, we wanted to define type families by induction. Okay, that's one reason we want universes. The other big reason we want universes is to have a bit of polymorphism. So we want to write polymorphic terms Um, or if you think of the terms as programs, you want polymorphic programs. And an example of that is um, instead of defining for every type an identity function. So the identity at A will be a function from A to A uh, for each individual type A. With the universe, uh, with a universe, U, we have a polymorphic identity. So this is something that looks like this. It depends on the universe. And then it's a pi type. And then it says for every type in a universe, a universe is gonna be a collection of type. And for every type in the universe, you will have a function on the terms of that type 
to the term. So that's it. And I'll explain what this T is and why we actually we will not write it very often. And it's just to give you a little preview. We would like to have, so the main thing you have to take away here is that instead of writing one identity uh, function for every type, we can write something that works more generally for many types at once. And, Rick, there's a yeah. question about yeah. how rigorously the first assertion has been proven that you can't prove that zero is not one without oh, uh, universes. Ab absolutely rigorously, I would say. Um, we can we can talk on the Discord about references. Um, I will have to dig something up, but um, I definitely can provide some references. Uh, but can't do that. Also, I'll, I'll mention uh, the model uh, when we get to it. It's actually not very difficult. Okay, and the third reason is I'm putting it this way to do category theory in a streamlined way. Category theory in a streamlined way. And for those of you who've heard about them, you should think about Grotendieck universes. So when Grotendieck defined or revolutionized um, uh, algebraic geometry, he made good use of uh, universes. And the Grotendieck universes are very analogous to the universes in type theory and are used for basically the same purposes, basically to uh, make collections of types of certain kinds. So we'll be able to make a collection of all groups or a collection of all monoids. Uh, and we can work with these collections inside type theory using a universe. All right. So those are the three reasons I'm going to highlight. And uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So what is a universe? Now we know what, why we need them. What are they? What is a universe? So, uh, the slogan is that we get universes by reflecting on what we can do with types. So I'm going to phrase it like this. Whatever we can do, with types, we should be able to do with the universe. Oops. A universe. So it's a kind of reflection principle. We are thinking about, we've uh, worked with types and now we're gonna internalize just as, uh, just as the identity type is a kind of internalization into the theory of the notion of judgmental equality. So just as the identity type uh, is an internalization of the judgmental equality, uh, a universe U is an internalization of the judgment, um, say, a uh, type. Okay, so here comes the definition. So, and this is at the level we are defining type theory. So it's a meta level, if you like. So a universe is a type family And we're going to write the main components of it as u and t. So this is a type family So u is the base of the type family. So there's a type u. And then the type family says that in the context of a variable, I'm going to write it with the capital X. I'm going to think about it a little bit differently as uh, terms of other types. So if you have a variable of type u, then there is a type t of x, uh, which is supposed to be uh, the corresponding type. So you can think of the 
terms of you as coding types. So you have some, um, but that's basically what any type family is. But to be a universe, you need more to be more than just a type family. Um, you need to have all this, um, all the things that we could do with types beforehand. So uh, with, let's see if I can make room for all of this. So we have pi types in type theory. So we should also have, and the, the whole collection or the judgment of types are closed under forming pi types. So we should be able to reflect that inside the universe. So there should be a function pi check of the following type for every x in the universe and for every function from the terms of x to the universe, you should have a new element of the universe. So the, the, the inputs to this function pi check are analogous to the premises in the pi type formation rule. Pi type formation rule has two premises. You have a type and you have a type family over that type and you get a new type. And here we have a term in the universe and a family of elements in the universe indexed by the terms of that type X, T of X. And it has to satisfy an equation. And the equation is that when we now put it into the T family, so we take look at the terms of pi check of x and y, this is judgmentally equal to the pi type. So the pi type of the little x's, say in t of x, and then t, the terms of y of little x. So this has to be for every um, x in u and y from t of x to u. Okay, hope that makes sense. And then we do the same thing for sigma types. So we need a sigma check. And let's see if I can copy this and maybe make it a little bit easier here. Copy and paste that. It has exactly the same signature because the premises of the sigma type formation rule are the same as the premises of the pi type formation rule. And, but instead of decoding to the pi type, it's gonna to decode to the sigma type. So if you take T and plug in a sigma check of X, Y, this should be equal to the sigma type of X and T, X, T of Y, X in the same, for the same for every X and for every Y. Okay, what else did we say we had done with type theory so far? Actually, let me put it here. What can we do with types? Well, we can do pi types, sigma types, and we had some constant types that we have defined, empty, unit, and natural numbers. And we have co-products and identity types. So that's what we have here. And that's what I'll attempt to fit on the slide. So the constant uh, types we have, that is the empty type. So there should be an empty check, there should be a unit check, and there should be a net check in the universe such that, well, they decode to the corresponding types. So the, the terms of the type coded with empty check is empty empty type definitionally and t of the unit type check is the unit type definitionally judgmentally and t of n check is n okay almost there then there should be a binary operation plus check so that goes from u to u to u has two inputs just the two types that we form the co-product of such that uh, t of x plus check y decodes to t of x plus t of y, where this plus is the co-product type former. And then I'm going to go to a, make it 
go to the next page here. And last but not least, an encoding of identity types. So remember the formation rule of the identity types. We have a type. So this corresponds in the universe to having an element of the universe. And then the identity type formation rule has two terms of that type. So here, this means we have two elements of T of X. And if you have these, then you get a new element in the universe, which is the corresponding identity type, such that the, you take T, the terms of X equal check Y, this decodes to the identity type X equals to Y in the type T of X for every X in U and little x and little y in T of X. Okay, so this completes the definition. That's what a universe is, at least for now, um, because we're going to make, uh, well, well, yeah, let's make some discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss this uh, once we postulate the actual universe. So far, I've just told you what a universe is. Now we would like to have some universes to play around with. So here comes the, the part where we assume enough universes. universes. OK, so we make a postulate about our type theory. So just like we postulate the pi types and the sigma types and the other type formers, we're going to postulate universes. And it's going to be a whole schema, just like you think the, the co-product type form is a schema. For every type, for every pair of types, you have a co-product types. For the universes, we're going to say for every time we have some type families, we're going to have a corresponding universe. So the postulate is the following. Um, whenever we have finitely many type families. A type family is a judgment, something is a type in a context. So you have, you could have different contexts. So gamma one, the context gamma one, A one is a type and so on. And then finally many, let's say we have N many. So in context gamma N, A N is a type. We have N type families. And then the, what we postulate is that there is a universe And I'm just going to write UT, but of course it also has all the check operations. And this lives in the empty context. Uh, and they have to contain codes for all the elements that we get from these type families. So they have to contain these, uh, containing these, but mm, let's see that contains these. What does that mean? Uh, this means with terms of this universe type. So in context gamma i, we're going to have a term a i check in this new universe such that also in gamma i, the terms of a i check this type is the type AI. So we have the judgment. These two types are judgmentally the same. So this is for all I. Okay, that's what we're postulating. So let's see some examples of that. Um, let's see. Next thing. So what can we do with this postulate? The first thing we can do is we can look at the empty list. So n equals zero with no type families. What do we get? 
we get a base universe. And we're going to call this U0, U0. And um, we don't know anything about it except that it's a universe. That's all we know about it, but that's good enough. Often that's all you need. Then if you have a universe, so if U and T, write it here again, UT is a universe. Uh, then we get a successor universe. Um, is a successor universe. Underline that. And we are going to call that uh, U plus. Maybe I should write the whole pair. So U0, T0, and U plus, T plus. Uh, but there are also all the, um, the checks. So there's going to be an N check plus, et cetera. Um, so what do we know about this? Well, we have that, we, how do we get this? Well, we look at the, at the universe U, which is the two type families, namely in the empty context, U is a type. And in the context where X is a variable of type U, TX is a type. And we apply the postulate of universes, and then we get in the same context. So here we get, um, what should I call this? I should just call this U check. Uh, U check will be an element of the successor universe. And T in this context, T of U check is judgmentally equal to U. Uh, and then from this, you get in the context where X is in U, you get a T check of X in U plus. And in this context where X is in U, uh, T, oops, I should, this is a T plus. No, wait, yeah. Well, that should be a T plus, right. We have the new decoding. So U, U check is in U plus, so I can take a T plus to decode U check and that becomes U. And here I can take a T plus of the T check of X. And that is judgmentally equal to T of X. Right. So what you get in the successor universe is that you have a new universe that contains U and all the types in U. And then the other example we will use is that if you have a pair of universes, so if you have uh, U and with the corresponding T function, T, U, and you have V and T, V are universes. So this means we have um, four, now we are using it for four, um, four type families. So U is a type in, for every X in U, T U of X is a type, V is a type, and for every X in V, T V of X is a type. So, if you have these two universes, then we have a join. That's what we're going to call it. Then we have something, a universe, which we'll call the join or U square cup V and T U square cup V. And we can mechanically read out what, are we, what we get from these four type families, we get a code for U in the join. We get a code for all the types in U. So for every X in U, we get a T 
u check of x in u cup v and we get a v check in u cup v and for every x in v you get a t v check of x in u square cup v with the join of u v such that and let's see should i write it out maybe i'll just write it out so there's a decoding in the join of u check and that decodes to u etc i think you know the pattern now hope that's okay so those are the the main cases we will uh we will use the universe postulate so we can that's, that suffices for almost everything we want to do with universes Right. So, now let's, so let's someone ask the question that everyone's had on their mind the entire time. Why yeah. is all of this encoding necessary? Why not just do what you do in Agda and have terms of the universe literally be types? That's because the way we set up the judgments, it just is nonsense. Uh, there are judgments for something being a term and there are some judgments for something being a type. So to make sense of it, you have to formally have this uh, decoding. But of course, that was one of the next things I was going to say that in practice, you can uh, there's no ambiguity because we some exactly because it that it doesn't make sense uh, to mix the types and the terms. If I write uh, x is a type and x is a variable of u, it you can automatically plug in the t because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So we will indeed leave out the t almost always. But I think it is good to keep in mind that formally it's necessary. If you want to have a good uh, algebraic theory of what the judgments mean. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll, 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 I'll cover some discussions that might answer some of the, the immediate questions. Um, OK, so let's do a little bit of discussion about universes. So the first thing, let's do that that we just talked about. Uh, in practice, in practice, uh, we leave out, we leave out the T's um, uh, because they can be inferred. Because this can be inferred. From, and here I'm using context in the ordinary sense of the word, <laughs> so no pun intended. But if you're expecting a type and you have a variable or some term of a universe, then you must insert the T to get a type. So that's, but you can always figure that out. Okay, so that's one point. Um, maybe a more important is that the way we have defined universes, uh, they're open-ended. Universes are open ended. What does that mean? It means that there is uh, no requirement, for instance, no requirement uh, that, say, u0 or the successor or a join are minimal with respect to that they don't contain anything else uh, than is required. We're not assuming anything about that. No requirement that they are minimal. So they're not actually, uh, say, the least universe containing U or U cup V is not necessarily the least universe containing U and V and all the types in U and V. And um, another thing this means is that if and when we add new type formers, We'll want the universes to be to contain these as well, or be closed under these. We'll want the universes to be closed under these. So this could be uh, maybe someone has heard about W types. Uh, or 
higher inductive types or something we haven't even discovered or invented yet, um, whatever it might be, probably we'll want the universes to contain all of that as well. Um, okay, third point. So if we start with the base universe U0, we can iterate the successor universe construction. So we have U0, U0 plus, U0 plus, plus, etc. We might call them U1, U2, and so on. So we get this infinite hierarchy. Um, so this is a universe hierarchy. Uh, but with the rules we have so far, there's no requirement that all, all types are contained somewhere in here. Um, all types lie somewhere in here. In line this. So we might have maybe a universe that contains every universe in this hierarchy, or there might not be. We just haven't, um, we haven't said either way. On the other hand, if we just think about the reflection principle, um, that everything we can do with a finite list of type families, we can do with the universe. Uh, let's call that the universe reflection principle we have so far. Um, the universe reflection principle does not give us any new universes. More universes than these. Because you could, you could just from the start say, I have this universe hierarchy, U0, U1, and so on. And uh, whenever I want to apply the universe postulate, I look at all the universes that are occur in this finitely many uh, type families, and then I take the maximum universe index and I add one. And then the universe postulate is fulfilled and all you get are these universes. Okay. Final point is, uh, so from the reflection principle that whatever we can do with types we can do in universes, we might expect a bit more, we might, oops. So let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back at, to the previous slide. That was one thing I forgot to introduce. So in the case of a successor universe, well, maybe I'll put this here, we might expect for a successor universe for the process of U going to U, plus where we have a function a lift. So we get a, for any successor universe, we have a function that's called lift that goes from U to U plus. And how is it defined? This is lambda X in U, and then it's the um, code. So T check of X, uh, this lies in U plus, right? So by lambda abstraction, we get this function that lifts a type in U to the successor universe. So we might expect for these lift functions, for instance, to have some equations like this. So if you lift, um, I might even specialize, the point can be made already with the base universe and the successor universe. Um, okay, now the grammar will work out. So let me do in this case, so we have lift of, the code for the natural numbers. This is the code in U. And we might expect that when I apply this lifting function, this should be equal to judgmentally the code n check plus uh, as elements of U plus. But we don't get that um, by the postulate. So, uh, this is not assumed, although it's completely reasonable to do so. This is not assumed here and in the actor lectures. 
or, or even in ACTA. But it's highly useful and it's called, I'll fit that here. It's called cumulativity. If you have this property of your universes, then it's called that the universes are cumulative. If you have it for all, oh, Rick, there is an interesting question. Yeah, is it possible to define by natural number induction a map that sends each natural number to a successive universe? And if so, what would the type of that function be? Yeah, no, that's not possible. Um, you could try it. You can say um, try to apply the postulate. I think maybe we'll leave that as an exercise. But I'll just say no, that's not possible. Um, but I will say something a little bit about it uh, on the next slide. So thank you for the question. It's a very, very good point. Also related to the third point here that uh, the, the universe postulate we have in the lecture does not give us any more than this uh, countable hierarchy of universes. So let's make a, maybe a discussion about that. Um, yeah, so there are two further discussion points. So hang tight for one thing. I want to make another point first. So we might want something even better uh, so let me ask about this. So could you have what is known as type in type? So well, it's a bit annoying to have all these universe. Uh, could we have, could we have a universe? I'm just going to write you with a code you check as a term and the decoding of you check be you itself. That would be a wonderful system. Then we wouldn't need more than one universe because uh, universe contains itself and everything is nicely closed up. Um, and the type theory with such a universe is called a type theory with type in type. And there's even a flag in ACTA if you want to play around with it. And the answer to the question is no, uh, because of uh, something called Shirar's paradox. Actually, I should say uh, this was the case. This was the case in uh, one of the first versions of Martin of type theory. So in Martin of type theory, the version from 71. However, shortly thereafter that Per Martin Löw proposed this type theory, uh, Schirar discovered a paradox, a uh, der 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 derivation of a contradiction in this system. So Schirar showed in his thesis, in, uh, in his 72 th thesis, that this is inconsistent. inconsistent. And it, on the GitHub for the course, I put an ACTA file um, with a simpler version of this paradox, uh, simpler version. Due to Antonius Hürkens. Uh, that was from 95. So, and there's a, you see the in GitHub. If you want to see what the uh, derivation looks like, it's it's a version of the Borali Forti paradox that there's no ordinal of all ordinals. And um, another point also, if we assume, if we further assume, Uh, a generalized inductive type in U, then you can do a version of uh, Russell's paradox. And Russell's paradox appears. Typically, we do want generalized inductive types. So uh, then it's very simple to derive a contradiction in the version of Russell's paradox, paradox appears. OK, and that's all. I also put a file uh, on the GitHub for the course. Um, 
And I think you'll see that you can understand what's going on in this, whereas uh, to really understand what goes on in even in the simpler version of Shirao's paradox to the Hurkins, you really need to read a paper and uh, think about it quite deeply. Okay. Uh, now the other question, so the, coming, coming back to the question of what if we want more universes than an accountable hierarchy? So larger universes, oops. You can totally have larger universes. So um, you might say we want to reflect on the process of forming universes. Because now a new thing we can do with types is to form a universe con containing a finite family of, uh, of type families. Um, so we can propose, we, we propose, we can, we can, we don't do that, but we could propose uh, larger universes. Propose larger universes. For example, uh, something called the super universe due to Eric Palmgren. So a super universe is a universe that is closed under the universe, the, the successor universe operation. And you can come up with even larger universes. And then so in some sense, you could com compare it with the uh, large cardinal axioms in set theory, this game of uh, I've come up with stronger and stronger universes. Although I think it's a bit of an open question if we can quite match the dizzying heights that they have in set theory with universe type types. Okay, um, any questions at this point? Okay, if not, there was a question about what you meant by generalized inductives, and that was sort of answered, but I'd like to point out that the inductive is uh, data S with one constructor, uh, X and sets X to S to S. Yeah, I can actually, I can, I can just write it down. What is this one you need here? It uh, has a constructor, let's see, sup supremum, uh, that says, okay, for every X in U and for every, family, so let's call this inductive type V, because it's something like the cumulative hierarchy. So it's type V and the construct as one constructor. And it says that if you have any type uh, and you have a family of elements in V indexed by this type, then you get the new element of V. And the way you start getting elements, you start by taking X to be the empty type. Then there's a, you can do empty type elimination to get a function from empty type to V, even though you don't know to begin with what V is, and then you get a first element in V, and that's like the empty set. And then you can iterate like you do in the cumulative hierarchy. So this is consistent if V is an element in the successor of U, but if V is an element of U itself, if, which what you would get if you had type and type, then you get a contradiction. Yeah, so thanks for that. Anyway, this is all uh, in the file uh, on GitHub. Okay, so if that's been answered, then let me do a quick mention about something called universe polymorphism. All right, so remember that one of the motivations we had for introducing um, universes is that we can have a polymorphic identity function. So now for every U, for every universe U, we now have it U. Um, let's just define it. So with a new convention, 
that we leave out the t when it can be inferred. For every x and u, you get a function from x to x. And these have to be typed. So therefore, uh, if you want to be pedantic, you have to insert the, the t. But we, can, we don't have to be so pedantic. We can, we can infer it, so we just leave it up. Um, and what's the definition? The definition of the polymorphic identity type is lambda x, lambda x, x. Okay, so that's that. But it's a bit annoying that you now have this for every universe, but you still don't have an identity function that you can apply to all types. So, um, so this, this applies to types in U. Types in U, not to all types. So proof assistance so for instance, ACTA, but also uh, any other ones, maybe you mentioned Cock or Lean or Cool TT. I don't I actually don't know. I shouldn't say anything about Cool TT. Um, cool TT is super cool, but I don't know enough about it. Let's say etc. Um, they have what's known as universe. They have some version of universe polymorphism, and the interesting thing is it's all different. They have universe polymorphisms where you can write one thing down and have it apply to any universe. Um, so they have universe polymorphism mechanisms, let's say that, of different sorts. And I won't say exactly how it works. Maybe we'll talk about it in the ACTA track. Actually, I should mention that in ACTA, in ACTA, if you just write type, this is what I've called the base universe. It's U0. It's just a base universe by default. And if you want the successor of that, you write type one. That's the successor of that. And there are also type two and so on. In ACTA, you also have level judgments for managing this universe polymorphism. So you have uh, universe level judgments. That's what you have in a good theory about universe polymorphism. And then you can internalize that to, be, to get a level type. But the exact theory behind it is maybe a little underdeveloped. So that's research in progress. OK, that's all I'm going to say about that. OK. Um, we did the uh, polymorphic identity function. Now, the other motivation we wanted for universes, and now let's have some more examples uh, of universes in use. So um, one of the examples we wanted to have was type families defined by induction. And one of the simplest ones, and also a very useful one, is the is true type family on the Booleans. So it's a bool to the universe. So here I don't specify what the universe is, just for any universe you have such a thing. And if I wanted to be really formal, I would decorate it with a U here, but I'm not going to be so formal. And this is defined by case analysis, or maybe I'll do the same thing by pattern matching. So is true applied to false is um, the empty type. And is true applied to true is the unit type. OK, that's a type family you wouldn't be able to define uh, without a universe. And with this, uh, you can define true, not false. A type, if true is equal to false in the Booleans, then you have an element of the empty type. So this is um, 
by transport. Remember transport from the last lecture. So if you specialize transport to this family is, is true. And then so transport says that if you have a type family and a, an element in the identity type. So here we have an element of the identity type. So we apply this input. Um, so we have P. P has type true equals false. Then transport is a function from is true of true, which is the unit type to is true of false, which is the empty type. So you get this function from the unit type to the empty type. And you plug in the canonical element of the unit type, and then you have your element uh, in the empty type. So that's, uh, that's how you can prove that true is false. True is not false. <laughs> true is false implies false. Uh, false in the sense of the empty type. Okay, and you need, you actually need, so this is what's the other question. You need a universe for this. You need a universe uh, to do this. Because otherwise we have a model Uh, the, what we might call the types as propositions model. Um, where um, you model types as say sets where all the, every two elements are equal. So, or, or what's also known as, you're gonna call propositions, but so, it's a model where if you have a type X, uh, type is interpreted as a, well, another way of saying it, you get interpreted as a subset of um, the unit set. So, and this is possible if you don't have a, universe, but um, that's why we know that we cannot prove uh, true is not false without a universe, because without a universe, you have a model where, it's simple, where true is false. Okay, Johannes raised the hand. Uh, no, never mind. Okay. So that's one example. The other example um, is, I'll be a little brief about this because of time, but the observational equality on the natural numbers. So as a preview, we want to define uh, type family EN, which is a binary type family, but it's going to be small with respect to a universe. A type is called U small if it has a code in the universe. So an, a function into a universe encodes a type family, and here we have a type family in two, uh, two inputs over the natural numbers. So we want such a type family that represents. Uh, the identity type on the natural numbers. And by pattern matching, it's very easy. Uh, so we want zero and zero to give the unit type because we want to say that zero is equal to itself. And if you have zero and a successor, That should be the empty type. And if you have a successor of n is zero, that should be the empty type. And then we want the n of two successors, successor n, successor m. We want this to be equality in the natural numbers 
in M. So this is a recursive definition and um, you can define this in terms of the eliminator on the natural numbers if you define the if you use a function motive because we are uh, we need to in the recursive call re reduce both n and m so um, maybe i'll quickly write out just as an exercise in or with net lim we get that eek n M is equal to, well, we want to use net induction. So the point is that in the outer induction, we want to define a whole family of functions. So we have the type family over the natural numbers of uh, functions from N to U. And then in the base case, uh, let's see, right, this here. In, Ulrich, what yeah. exactly is a motive? Oh, a motive is um, the t in for all the induction principles. Remember, you give a type family over the inductive type, and then you give cases for the uh, constructors. And the motive is the type family, and then typically I call the the cases for each constructor is the methods, and so you, or maybe means. And if you have a motive and means, and you have an opportunity to use the eliminator, then you have a good definition by uh, induction. So the motive for this induction, the outer induction is for every X in the natural numbers, the whole, it's constant, doesn't depend on X, it's the uh, function type from N to U. So this, and let's say we want two arguments for the inductors, we want a base case, we want a case for N is zero, and we want a case for N being the successor of X. Uh, let's see. And then we, we are, so we have something here, something here, and then I plug in n. So that's going to be filling up this term. And then so in the base case, I want a function from n to u. So this takes in um, an m. Maybe I'm just going to shatter it. Or let me call it y. Uh, and then we want to do induction on y. So we want another case of net induction. And now the motive is going to be slightly different. Um, it's going to be constant in the universe. And then in the base case now for so there's two cases and we plug in the y. And the base case when y is zero or um, yeah, then the whole, okay, so now I have to find it. Okay, there's going to be an m at the end. Okay. Um, so then y is zero and x is n is zero, n is zero, n is zero and m is zero. I'm going to get the unit type. Okay, there we go. And then uh, let me move this comma, make a little more room and remind myself what's happening. So in this case, we have, uh, let's say, this is basically going to be the m equals zero case. And then afterwards going to be the m is a successor of some z. And in this case, we want to bind two variables. We want to bind a z for what m is the successor of and an induction inductive case x. But we're not going to use any of them because we're just going to return the empty type. And then here, we want to bind two uh, variables. We want to bind, let's say, uh, I'm going to call it, yeah, I can call it x. Uh, and an inductive hypothesis. So here f is going to be a function from n to u representing uh, the function eek n applied to x and then having another input. So that's the induction hypothesis. And then we're going to do an induction. Uh, uh, we're going to make a lambda abstraction and then we're going to do an induction on that uh, on that y again with the same motive plugging in the y here and then in the base case now it's the empty type and here i can bind a set and an x and now i apply the induction inductive case f so i apply f to um, 
mm -hmm. to the Z, I guess. Okay, I think that's the right term. This is how you decode this pattern matching, which is, looks so nice and clean into eliminators and it's always a bit fiddly. I hope I didn't make a mistake. Yeah? I can take a question now if you want. I don't do wanna finish the point about this relatively soon. So here's the point. Um, so we can prove that this is reflexive. Let me just copy over uh, this, the nice pattern matching definition. I'll make a copy of that. Move to the next slide. Take a smaller version of that. So now we prove that this is a reflexive relation. Uh, we could prove this is reflexive. I should spell that out. We flexive, and that means that for every n in the natural numbers, you have an element of eq n n n, and we prove this by induction on n because in the base case you have the unique element of the unit type. And in the recursive case, you can recurse because you already know that you have an element of eq n n n, and that gives you then an element of eq n suck n suck n, um, because that's these types are definitionally the same. Then by path induction, or by yeah by path induction, we get um, we get a function of type. For every n and m in that, if n is equal to m, then you get an element of e n n n, right? Because to apply path induction, it suffices to look at a reflexivity case. And in the reflexivity case, we sort it by proving that the relation is reflexive. And um, by induction, by double induction, we get for every n and m and n. Um, if you have an element of n and m, then n is equal to m. Okay, this function, you do induction on n and m, and you compute what the input type here is, and then you you just get it. Let's maybe write this down. We get a function that's called g. So g of 0, 0, and something. The c is an element of the unit type. We don't really need it. We just return refl at 0. And then g, 0, successor m, and then a c. Now c is an element of the empty type, so I can do a empty induction on C. And the same case for successor N and zero, it's also an empty induction on C. And then the interesting case, if you have two successors, now C is gonna be an element of eq N N M, but I already have by induction that the function g at lower cases, again, by having a more complicated motive, I can apply g to n and m uh, and c. And that's, oh, I should maybe be a little careful. What is this? The type of this is n equal to m. And I need to prove that a uh, successor of n is equal to the successor of n. And I can take the action on paths of the successor function on that. So maybe just write that in a different color here. This term has type n equal to m. And now the whole thing has type successor n equals successor m, which is what I need here. Okay. Well, that didn't go too fast uh, because we now want to spend the rest of the time talking about the Curry-Howard interpretation. 
So let me start on that. Uh, Curry, Howard. So this is also known as the propositions as types interpretation. And I wanted to say a few words about the history of this, but let me just uh, write down what it, what it is first. So we're going to have two different worlds. So we're going to have propositions or mathematical statements. So informal. Uh, mathematical statements. And we can encode them as types in type theory according to a, an interpretation scheme. And under this interpretation, the proofs, so let's say we have a proposition P and it's going to be encoded as a type A. And the proofs of P is going to be interpreted as certain as terms or elements of A. And the reason we call this Curry-Howard or not just, and not just propositions as type is, is uh, even an, an extra level of this interpretation that equality of proofs, equality of proofs um, of a proposition P is going to be interpreted as judgmental uh, equality of terms. OK, so what is the uh, interpretation? So there's a always true proposition, the true proposition, and we interpret that as the unit type. And this makes sense because there is a proof of the true proposition because it is true after all, and there is a term of uh, the unit type. And it makes sense to say that any two um, proofs of the, the unique true proposition are equal. And that's just, well, I don't, it, it would be the case if we have the ADA rule for the unit type. So maybe I have to be a little careful about, about this point. But okay. Uh, that's, for the most of the part, I'll stick to the first two levels here. Um, there's a false proposition, which we interpret as the empty type. That makes sense because there are not supposed to be any proofs of false if we are in a consistent logic. And proofs of an implication, P implies Q, we want to think of as terms of the corresponding function type. So if P is interpreted as a type A and Q is interpreted as a type B, then a proof of an implication that P implies Q, we want to think of that as a function that transforms an element of A to an element of B. After all, this says that if you can prove P, that if you have a term of type A, the function, you can apply the function and you'll get a term of type B, which then going back the other way will be a proof that Q is true. Special case of this uh, is that the case of negation. Uh, negation is in logic equivalent to imp implies false. And so I'll just use the same interpretation here. This A implies the empty type. Uh, now becomes a little more interesting. Uh, proofs of a disjunction. We in a disjunction we're going to interpret as the coproduct type, at least in this interpretation. And uh, I'll say a little bit about his. I'll try to say a bit about historically why this is a good choice and why it's not um, always a good choice. Why we might refine this interpretation later. If we have a type. And we're mixing types and propositions a bit. If we have a type A and we have a family of statements, a statement parameterized by a type A, we have P of X um, family of statements, we interpret it as a, as a pi type for every X and A, P of X. And likewise for existential, we will in this interpretation interpret that as a sigma type. And finally, uh, the proposition that x is equal to y in a type A, we interpret that as the identity type itself. Okay, so that's the interpretation. So let me talk about the brief history of this. Um, Let 
Oops. Okay. Um, we call it the Curry Howard interpretation after a 1969 note uh, by Howard, which laid out all the three levels of this in perfect lineup. And this was for the case of arithmetic. Case of arithmetic. So number theory, statements about numbers where this makes perfect sense. And um, the, the types he had in mind all corresponded to statements about numbers. So there was no problem with, um, with having using a disjoint union because the natural deduction rules for disjoint union precisely corresponds um, to the natural deduction rules for disjunction. And you didn't have any propositions in number theory that depend on a proof of a disjunction. So this was the perfect interpretation. In fact, it was inspired by earlier work on Curry. In fact, there was a textbook by Curry and Fies, which had almost the same ideas. Um, this book was called Combinatory Logic, had many of the same ideas. Um, in fact, Curry in already in the 30s, uh, had some of the same ideas. And in fact, we, we can go all the way back to Brouwer in 1908. Um, oops. Uh, Brouwer had a paper called the, on the unreliability of the logical laws in which he said that, well, we should reject the law of excluded middle because a proof of a disjunction uh, should tell you to be a method for saying it either should have a canonical value and should result in either a proof of the less left disjunct or a proof of the right disjunct. And so the law of excluded middle, so he rejects uh, LEM in the form P or not P because there's no method that for an arbitrary proposition tells you whether P is true or the negation of P is true. And this was somehow the, the birth of in, intuitionistic mathematics. And this was then later in the 20s and 30s formalized to some extent by uh, student Haiting and the Russian mathematician Komogorov. So they had parts of this interpretation in the sense that they said, well, an, a proof in intuitionistic mathematics on constructive logic of an implication should be a method of transforming a proof of A into a proof of B. The problem with this from the point of view of classical mathematicians, in particular, maybe uh, Gödel uh, and Kreisel, was that if from a classical point of view, it's circular. If you say that to prove a an implication, you have to have a method such that if you have an element of A, then when you apply it uh, to an, the, the method to that element, you get an element of B. Well, that's an implication in the meta language. So you're trying to interpret implication via implication. So that's somehow a Zeno's paradox in logic. So it can't be an explanation of what implication is in that sense. But then somehow the ideas of Curry via the uh, Church's and Curry's uh, Lambda calculus and then crystallized in Howard's paper is that you can think of another way, way of thinking about having a function of, from A to B is at, as an analytic thing. That's something you just look at it and you have typing rules that says that, okay, this really is a function from A to B. And that you have, then you avoid this paradox of explaining implication in terms of implication. And this then led directly to type theory uh, via Pierre Martin Leuf. Um, but also, um, there's a similar story by Dana Scott, I should mention. And then independently, um, the Brown, 
late 60s or early 70s and then mind of type theory is also uh, early 70s and others so i don't have time to do a whole history of type theory but basically you can see type theory is an offshoot of this interpretation Maybe I can't resist adding one more thing in the uh, history that it was in uh, 36 that we got the definition of Turing machine. So before that, there was some idea that uh, maybe uh, in constructive mathematics, uh, proofs of implication should have something to do with constructive methods, not just an arbitrary function, but in constructive function. And in fact, these, so these constructive mathematics predates computability theory by quite a while. But there's another way of spinning off um, this interpretation in terms of really interpreting proofs as computer programs uh, that are Turing machines via the uh, realizability interpretation. That's a whole other subject. Realizability, maybe put the name of Kleene here. Okay, that's a compressed story, but at least now you have some, uh, some starting point. Um, the paper by Howard is eminently readable uh, from where you are now. And there's also a nice overview by um, Phil Wadler. Maybe I will link to that. Okay, any questions at this point? Otherwise I'll go and do some examples. Okay. Um, So, so this interpretation is very suitable for doing number theory. So let's do a little bit of number theory. Um, so let's talk about how we encode in type theory, the theory of divisibility on the natural numbers. So we make a definition. So we make a type. So if um, K and N are natural numbers, we want uh, to represent the mathematical statement that K is a divisor of N. So this should be a type. And indeed we define it. So saying this type is equal to, well, what is uh, as a normal statement in mathematics, we say, well, there exists if, this means there exists a D in the natural numbers uh, such that um, K times D is equal to N. And now we apply the interpretation, say, okay, an existential statement, we encode that with a sigma type. So we make sigma of D natural numbers and then an identity and equation, we use the identity type. So we say, say we've already introduced multiplication, say by, by recursion. So K times N, no, K times D, sorry, K times D is equal to N. So we take a mathematical statement that we want to study and then we can encode it as a corresponding type. And then we can prove some things about it. So for instance, we have the mathematical statement uh, for, for all n, uh, one divides n and n divides n. Always the case that we have these two divisors and this we encode as, so let's encode it as a pi type. So the for all statements encoded as a pi type pi of all natural numbers. And then we have these two things, uh, one divides n, and then the conjunction we could encode with the product type, which is a special case of the sigma, right? Um, n divides n. And then the proof, oops, the proof, uh, lambda n, and then we have to give a 
pair of proofs. And each of these proofs is going to be a pair. And let's see, I want the witness that one divides n, that's n. And then there's some uh, term of the identity type, it's called pn. Let's say pn, something we've prepared on the side is a proof that one times n is n. It might be reflexivity, depending on how you've defined multiplication, or it might not be. And the other case, we want one here, and then another proof, say q, qn, where qn is a term we've made of type n times one is identified n. I guess one of these will be reflexivity, but not the other, or maybe none of them, depending on exactly how we've defined multiplication. As another example, um, we have the proposition that uh, everything divides zero for all n. Oops. n divides zero. So again, that becomes the pi type, pi over all n and n, n divides zero with proof or term or as we sometimes say, proof term, uh, lambda n, and then I guess we can use zero. And then we want some Rn where Rn has type um, n times zero is zero. Okay. So note here, the way we set things up, um, we have other proofs of zero divides zero. So zero divides zero is a type, which is the sigma type, uh, oops, D and N, um, zero times D zero, but we always have a term of this type. So we'll, we have, uh, we have, uh, the terms D, let's see what's a new letter, maybe SD in this type. So not just the one you get from the previous proof terms, uh, zero are zero, but also DSD, where SD is a proof that uh, zero times D Okay, so that's a feature of uh, this interpretation that you might end up with an encoding of a mathematical statement that has many different proofs. So I think you could prove that um, these terms are different because if, if two elements of a sigma type are equal, then taking the action of paths of the first projection, you get that the first projections are equal as well. So um, are many different elements of this type. Okay. Now for the last thing I want to talk to you about today. Is uh, the principle of type theoretic choice and something related to that. So we've seen how this interpretation works really well uh, for number theoretical statements. Let's see how it fares with a bit more general statements. So suppose uh, we have two types, A and B, and you have a type family um, over the product. So we can think of this as in the context X and A, so X, X and A, and Y and B, we have a type R of X, Y. Okay. Uh, so R is a correspondence or a heterogeneous relation, if you like. Okay, and then I say we have um, we have implications both ways from these two types. The one is 
pi x, oops, make my x is a little nicer, pi x and a, sigma y b. So we read this and then r of x y. So this is the encoding of the statement for every x, there exists a y, r of x y. And then I say we have functions back and forth to sigma f from a to b pi x and a r of x f of x. So this is via the correspondence, it encodes a statement there exists a function from a to b such that for every x and a r of x f of x holds. So in this direction from left to right, it's a kind of axiom of choice. If we have that for every x there exists a y, then you get a function that picks out the y. And that's because under this interpretation, we interpret exists as a very constructive thing where we can project out the pair. So it's very easy to write down. Um, so this is the Curry-Howard uh, interpretation of AC, at least going left to right. So we, if you want a function from left to right, um, you send a function, a term of this type to just, I want a, uh, want a function. So the function is lambda x and then take the first projection of h of x. Um, and then the second part is another function pi type lambda x, the second projection hx. Um, and I'll let you write, well, maybe it's so quick to write the term for the other direction. Um, the other direction, if you have, let's use uh, sigma induction. Oops. So by sigma induction, we may assume we have an f and let's say an, an h, and then we map that to an element of this big, this pi type here, and it's going to be lambda x, and then we pair up f of x and h of x. So in this sense, we have the axiom of choice in type theory, but of course that's kind of cheating because you know that the axiom of choice in set theory is a very strong and powerful principle. You can get all sorts of non-intuitive consequences of this, and you're not going to get any non-intuitive consequences out of this one. So we'll return. Uh, we'll return later uh, to the real, if you like, the real axiom of choice, once we have a different interpretation of propositions. Okay, I, I'm all out of time. There was one more thing I wanted to say, but I think I'll, I'll save it for next time. Okay, thank you, Ulrich. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. There is one. Abraham, I'll allow you to speak one second. Allow to talk. Abraham, do you want to ask your question? Ah, uh, he says his mic isn't working. Uh, so he types. So this version is weaker than the real axiom of choice about uh, what you have here. Or yes, yeah. Because we can just prove it in a purely constructive setting. Later on, we'll we'll see that we can add classicality axioms, um, including the real axiom of choice, and that will be much stronger, a much stronger system. Okay. Are there any further questions? Uh, did any questions, uh, interesting questions, come up in the Q and A? Maybe the TAs now. If not, then let's thank Ulrich again. 
Um, and next week on Monday, we will return with uh, Martinez Cardo's uh, last ACTA lecture. And then on Wednesday, Ulrich will continue um, with his series. And on Friday, we'll have uh, Dan Licata starting a new series on ACTA. Uh, I hope everybody will have a, have a great weekend and see you all on Monday.